Welcome, everyone. Uh, super excited to be with you all, despite the little technical challenge. Uh, Zoom apparently was down for it for a few minutes here, so we'll, we'll give it maybe an extra second buffer for people to join. Um, like crossing every finger I have on my body that we're good for now and it's going to carry on. I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Charles de Vilmarin. I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior, and it's an honor, a privilege, and, and just uh, a big bag of joy to and fun to uh, to welcome everyone. So, a little bit of background. So, Link Senior is this uh, is a resident engagement platform for senior living. It's a company that I co-founded. We're based in Washington D.C. We started Activity Strong, believe it or not, more than three years ago. So, this is our third. Uh, Activity Strong 20 uh, Activity Strong Summit, and we're very excited to uh, to have this third edition for you to present this third edition for you today. Uh, Activity Strong was uh, introduced, led by Link Senior, but lives and has been a, a, able to do amazing things thanks to its partnership with Activity Connection, NAP, and NCAP. So. I am actually very excited to introduce you all uh, to our panel, but just before I do do that, a few housekeeping reminders. So up to six NAB, NCAP, NCTRC, and or NCCDPCU's credit are available for today. To earn the credit, you need to attend the four sessions. So as, as few as one session or as many as six, and you need to fill up the CU uh, survey no, long, no later than midnight on Friday, June 25th, so we can process the certificate of attendance and issue again up to six hours of CUs. Please do note that due to the high number of attendees, we'll send the certificates uh, via email throughout next week, so the week of June 27th, and no later, no later than July 1st, by the end of the day. If you have any questions, please send them to webinars with an S webinars at linksenior.com. Uh, as a reminder, this session is recorded. Also, I, I know we're all Zoomed out and experts in Zoom, but as a reminder, if you want uh, to use the chat and the Q&A, please do that. The Q&A is more get towards the, uh, the, the panelists. Uh, we, Megan and I, and the rest of our team is going to filter through the chat and bring up elements for our panelists as well. And then last but not least, um, if you want to chat with everyone, which is highly recommended, we love when you do that, please make sure you select from the drop-down panelists and attendees, otherwise it's going to go, or everyone, because otherwise it's just for the panelists. So last things before I get started, for the ones that are playing uh, our, our virtual bingo game, and I hope many of you are, um, as you might realize that the uh, box for each session with a, uh, a secret code word and so the secret uh, word for this session, for the first session, is the word purpose. So that's uh, kind of a quick um, going through our, our details here. Yeah. I'm, I'm honored, honored is probably the right word, to uh, welcome everyone and introduce our esteemed panel. Not only do they represent um, activity and life enrichment professionals, but they also belong in leading organizations that have helped the industry do as great as it did through this pandemic and help our industry continue to shine. So I'm very honored to um, uh, introduce everyone to our first session today, Voice of Activity and Life Enrichment Director. And for that, I give you uh, Alice Attack from NAP, Linda Rehead from NCAP, and this session is gonna be moderated by uh, Carrie Fairshield, Community Marketing Specialist with Activity Connection. So with that, Carrie, I'll let you take it over. And thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Charles. I'm really excited to be here. I'm Carrie Fairchild from Activity Connection. And I am really excited to be the moderator today. And um, our first session, I'm just going to hop right in, is the voice of Activity and Life Enrichment Directors. Um, COVID-19 has truly exposed the life-sustaining need for social engagement with residents and senior living. <clears throat> the activity professional has continued to step up and meet daily challenges during this unprecedented event. We have carried on through with using technology 
creative approaches to quality of life and innovative, innovative adaptations for the psychosocial and functional needs of our senior population through developing personal relationships with the individuals we serve. This session will explore the current state of social engagement with our care communities regarding regulatory expectations and guidance. We will review the positive takeaways of engagement and how social prescription will change the way we provide quality of life. And uh, our learning objectives today, we're going to understand the current state of guidance and regulatory compliance as issued by CMS, as well as the CDC. The second objective is to learn how to identify the best practices and <laughs> the success of social prescription following this healthcare pandemic. The third objective is going to be identifying the ongoing resources for the community, as well as the activity professional. So like I said, I'm Carrie Fairchild, and I'm really glad to be here. I'm very excited. This is my first time, and uh, I'm uh, with Activity Connection. If you're a subscriber, you may be most familiar with my work as the voice of many of Activity Connection's musical recordings and the primary contributor to their food and cooking section over the last decade. I have recently stepped into the role of community engagement for Activity Connection, managing our website, forum, and social media channels, among other things. I have over 20 years of experience working in supported living environments and providing life enrichment services to seniors and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I really enjoy meeting new people and I am loving my current role in helping to support the Activity Connection community. Um, I would next like to introduce, excuse me, I'm, <laughs> hold on a second. Technical difficulties. Oh dear. <laughs> Most familiar with my work as the voice of many of activity oh dear. connections and musical oh dear, recordings. Dear, dear. And sorry about that. Hold on a second. We got a lot of technical difficulties, right, Carrie? I'm yes. Alisa Tag. I'm the I'm association so director. That's okay. I'm the association director with the National Association of Activity Professionals. I'm very happy to be with you once again for three years in a row. Thank you, Link Senior, for including NAP in this amazing experience of the Activities Strong uh, Summit and the commitment you have to the activity profession. We are ever grateful for that. Um, I currently serve as the Association Director for the National Association of Activity Professionals, and I have been a consultant through NCAP since the year of 2006, working primarily with uh, skilled nursing facilities. My most recent uh, endeavor has been working in pediatric skilled nursing for the last six years, which I have absolutely found mm -hmm. great enjoyment working with pediatrics. As not as much as I did with working with the elderly, because it is a totally different, um, different way of, of thinking and everything. And so I'm really excited to, to be with you today and present with Linda Redhead, um, the incoming president of NCAP. Well, thank you, Alyssa. I am Linda Redhead. I'm uh, currently the vice president for NCAP, and I'll be uh, the president starting in July. I've worked with many different populations. I eventually um, my uh, passion working for elders. I've been working for over 34 years. I can't believe it. Uh, I originally uh, graduated from the School of Visual Arts. Uh, my major was art therapy. And uh, I, I got my graduate degree at the College of New Rochelle. I became a MEPAP instructor. And then I got involved with NCAP as a board member for many years. It seems like once you get in, you never leave, right, Alyssa? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, so uh, NCAP uh, was created in 1986 by NAP as uh, the National uh, Certification Council for Activity Professionals was uh, 
uh, accepted by CMS as the credentialing body that fulfills the requirements for uh, OBRA and uh, the requirements for activity directors to run life enrichment and activity programs in long-term care settings. For over 30 years, NCAP has been the leader in credentialing for person-centered care and uh, evidence-based and proven to advance the physical and cognitive and psychosocial well-being of older adults. And to date, NCAP has trained and certified over 150,000 individuals in the use of social model of care and is recognized for delivering the highest skills and competencies, competencies via curriculum, practicum, and third-party exam. So NCAP certification uh, is designed to meet federal and state regulations and behavioral health tags, reduce the risk, improve uh, resident family satisfaction, increase socialization, enhance quality of life, and promote overall well-being. So that's NCAP. All right, so let me start. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor uh, to be here for the summit. Uh, I want to first look at the social prescription. But before we, we look at the social prescription, we must look at ourselves. What do we want at our core? The most basic desire that we have. Um, and, 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 and the most basic desire that we have is to be connected in some way to others. It's to be loved, to be needed, to, to be happy, to feel peaceful. And it's really important to feel that reassurance from another, someone else who uh, may have faith in you, who you feel may be on your side someone who has your back. And this can be communicated through a simple, sincere smile, uh, a kind word, a listening ear, or an honest compliment. And that is where the connection is made. Um, and these are all the things at their most basic core. This is what we all want. And Alyssa and Carrie and I, we, we serve elders. Along the continuum of long-term care, we, we serve in different capacities. And this is something that we're very passionate about, increasing the quality of life of our elders. And, and we related to that along with all of the other presenters here at this conference, understand this want and what this want is all about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, early on in this pandemic, there was a serious misstep. Uh, uh, closing off of that social connection for the sake of preserving health and safety. And people were forced to be isolated, not just for a few days or a few weeks or, or even a few months, but for almost two years. And there are some communities right now that are still experiencing restrictions due to increased COVID infection rates. And, and I'll share my, my own mother's story as there are some parallels between her story and um, what residents experience in assisted living or skilled care, and for that matter, even in the general community. And, and I hope someone out there will benefit from hearing about my experience, my personal experience. My, my mom is 80 years old now, and she lived in her home for over 40 years, home that my father built with his own two hands. And my mom uh, stayed home. She raised us, myself and my sister, and she was extremely dependent upon my father. And they did everything together. He managed all of the bills, maintained the home, took her everywhere she needed to go. And they went shopping to the gym, to the park, wh wherever. Well, he passed away more than 11 years ago, peacefully in his sleep at 84 years of age. And we came and helped as much as we could, but I lived two hours away and my sister lives out of state. So my mom had to quickly learn how to do things for herself. And now fast forward a few years and we start to observe and suspect that she's exhibiting some early signs of dementia. But we had hoped that because she was so hard of hearing at that time that that was why she was having cognitive issues. And so she was so resistant in getting those hearing aids, but she finally broke down and got them. And we then thought that she'd be okay. She was not okay. 
toward the end of 2019, my mom was hospitalized for increased confusion and she won herself the diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia. And then COVID hit and the whole world shut down. Well, you must understand as a, as a frame of reference, my mom, she had a large family. She was one of nine siblings, but most of her siblings had passed on or, or were living in Puerto Rico. And, and so the only source of socialization that she received pre-pandemic was at the senior center where she went to every day. And now with COVID that was closed. So she also had the misfortune of getting involved with a fellow who did not have her best interests in mind. And he sought to take advantage of her diminished cognition and take control of her finances and her home. And I'll, sp I'll spare you the details of all of that, but as you can imagine, this was a great source of stress for my family. And eventually my mom started having hallucinations and uh, episodes of wandering in a neighborhood in which the police were involved along with multiple, multiple hospitalizations. Uh, within a short period of time, she went from being a strong woman who always took pride in her appearance to a shell of her former self, someone who no longer cared for personal hygiene, obviously depressed with a flat affect and wore inappropriate clothing, which was often filthy. Next slide, please. So uh, these are the results of a survey conducted uh, two years ago. This gives you an idea of what elders experienced during the pandemic. 55% uh, of people living alone are getting less contact with their family. And 35% of the elderly, like my mom, were more lonely as a result of the lockdown. And more than 25% of elderly people are less able to get essential groceries. And 20% of elders over the age of 70 had contact with family less than once every two weeks. Next slide, please. So here is another survey from the National Poll on Healthy Aging conducted by the University of Michigan in uh, 2020. 41% of adults between the ages of 50 and 80 felt a lack of companionship, as opposed to 34% in 2018. A whopping 56%, more than half, felt isolated from others, as opposed to 27% just two years earlier. And 46% had infrequent social contact in 2020, as opposed to 28% two years earlier. So you could see the differences between these two time periods. And in another study by the Health Resources and Services Administration, uh, they say that loneliness is more dangerous than obesity and as damaging to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And there's also a 45% increase of mortality in seniors who report feeling lonely. So this is what the pandemic did. It created a perfect storm for loneliness to occur. It put my mom in a place that made her victim to a predator and accelerated the horrible progression of her dementia. And this is the regression that many of our residents experience with social isolation. And what happened during this time I was wrong. It was just terribly wrong. There, there was just no support systems in place to help my mom, even though there were medical personnel involved in her case. And it was during that last hospitalization last June that I and my husband decided to take matters into our own hands. And there was just no way that she could go back home on her own. On her own. She was just so confused. So we brought her home to live with us and try the best we could to undo all the damage that had been done. And I, I can't believe today is the one year anniversary of all of that. June 21st of last year was the day that we took her home, the day that had the most light. So this whole experience has taught me that there must be a culture shift. 
perspective in society and how we treat our elders. And, and that's where social prescribing comes into the picture. Social prescribing is um, not as common in the United States, um, but with this push for person-centered care, I hope it starts to take momentum. It's popular in the UK and, and in Canada, and, and basically a primary physician will refer their patient to a line work, uh, link worker, sort of like a social worker and a primary care physician or um, nurse practitioner. They, they don't always have enough time to really get to know their patient and understand the complete picture of their life. And, and, and there may be treatment gaps that can't always be resolved with a pill. So this brings me back to my original point, which is what do we want? And that is what the link worker is looking to find out. Link workers uh, give people the time they need. They focus on what matters to the person that they're talking to. They're, they take a holistic um, approach to the person's health and well being. The pandemic caused so much loneliness that caused stress and it affected sleep. And that's what my mother suffered from for so many years. She had chronic insomnia, which was aggravated during this time. And the pandemic put people into situations where um, they could not eat properly, they were more prone to abuse alcohol and drugs, uh, in general, just affected physical health. And it is the job of the link worker to work with that patient and create goals together and then connect them to the resources in the community that will meet their needs. Um, resources that will uh, connect them to what matters to them, bringing back that hope, decreasing, their stress and anxiety and, and minimizing depression so that they can feel empowered and improve their quality of life. And that's what creating connections with others can do. So this is what the uh, social prescription can look like. We're looking to create opportunities for a healthy lifestyle that can involve healthy nutrition, improved sleep, doing hobbies or taking classes to learn new things, um, exercising, meditating, practicing your faith and fostering social connections. This is what can be involved in the social prescription. And my mother now no longer um, struggles with loneliness as much as she did. She, she now has the joy of seeing her family and her grandchildren each and every day and, and she's an active participant in an adult daycare program. And she gets so much attention there now. Really, the staff there, they're just, they're just wonderful to her. And, and that's what we want, to be connected. So what have we done differently since the pandemic? Well, it's, it's about exploring how to build up our strengths, increase engagement and relationship with others, and that's what we do as activity professionals and life enrichment uh, professionals. We serve our folks. We provide the compassionate guidance and support that they need. Um, relationships don't last uh, because of good times. They last because the hard times were handled with love and care. And in the end, this is about caring. It's about bringing back that peace and, and love and happiness that we all want and need. And in long-term care, it is so important to keep the families connected to their loved ones, which uh, brings up the topic of visitation. Uh, Alyssa, I know you have lots of information regarding visitation and, and regulatory guidance. Yeah, thank you, Linda. Yes, you know, visitation has really changed, as we know, over the last two and two and a half years on what should be done with that. And, you know, visitation is person centered. And we really need to consider the residents' physical, mental, and psychosocial well being and support their quality of life. So in March of 2022, we have seen lots of changes when CMS re implemented the importance of in person visitation. So while taking that person centered approach and adhering to the core principles of the COVID-19 infection prevention, 
Outdoor visitation is still preferred when the residents and or the visitors are not up to date with all the recommended COVID-19 vaccine doses, but outdoor visits generally, because they generally predict a, a lower risk, right, of transmission due to increased space and airflow. But facilities still must allow for indoor visitation at all times for all residents as permitted under the regulations. So while previously acceptable during the the you know the facilities can no longer limit that so they cannot limit how often visitation occurs and they cannot limit the amount of visitors that come in and they really can't require advanced scheduling of visits either so although there is no limit to the number of visitors that a resident can have at one time visits should be conducted in a manner that still adheres to the core principles of COVID-19 infection prevention and does not increase risk to other residents. So facilities continue to need to ensure that physical distancing can still be maintained during the peak times of visitation. Generally, that's during lunchtime, right, or after business hours. And so as facilities need to really continue to avoid like large gatherings where large numbers of visitors are in the same place at the same time and where physical uh, distancing cannot be maintained, during that indoor visitation, though, facilities should limit the visitor movement within the facility. So, for example, you know, visitors should not be given carte blanche, right, to walk around the facility, but rather go directly to where their designated visiting station is. And, you know, I, obviously we still have to follow whatever our local health authorities guidance is for this and how direction should be taking place, depending on what the rates of your COVID uh, infection is in your communities at the time. And we know COVID is increasing again today. Um, I have several several colleagues and or and facilities in my community that are that are really dealing with COVID once again. And we know that face coverings are still mandated in our communities and physical distancing should still be provided as much as possible. And visitors should be wearing face coverings during their during their visits with our residents, regardless of their facts, their vaccination status. So if your county community levels of transmissions is substantial to high, Right now, regardless of vaccination status, all visitors should wear that face covering and keep the keep the di physical distancing going. And then when when areas are still low to moderate in transmission, the safest practice is still to continue wearing face coverings and masks as needed, particularly if either of the either of the individuals, the resident or the visitor are not up to date on their their recommended COVID-19 vaccine doses. So red, residents, regardless of vaccination status, can choose to either wear or not wear a face mask or covering when other residents are not present or have close contact with them, or residents and their visitors who are not up to date with their vaccines. We obviously, we continue to uh, honor resident rights with our residents, and we recommend what the, what the guidance is right now, but we also need to recognize that residents have that right. So while we recognize that transmission can occur, we acknowledge, you know, that there are still risks to COVID-19. And so it is really important that we allow for the residents to make that choice, that we remind the visitors that they do need to continue to wear the face coverings at all times, but we don't have to always do all the things that we had to do prior. Now, I know some tests, some facilities are still testing depending on vaccination status, but that's not a requirement now to enter the facility. So looking at that and recognizing that there's changes all the time, it takes us into what's really been going on with the effects of COVID. And this is such an important thing too, because we have seen long COVID systems that can drag on after someone gets ill with COVID for a much longer period of time than we would expect, right? And some of those symptoms include fatigue, shortness of breath or breathing difficulties, uh, maybe a cough or joint or chest pain or memory or concentration issues, maybe even trouble with sleeping, uh, muscle pain or headaches. So there's other symptoms too that include fast or pounding heartbeat, a loss of smell or taste, uh, depression, anxiety, fear, dizziness on standing, but the real problem that we're finding in, is the difficulty to determine if these symptoms are actually long COVID or something new. 
because COVID related trauma can affect people who have never even had the virus. And this occurs when someone is being asked to do things outside of their moral values or their social or their moral norms are being violated. And this can include preventing family members from being at the bedside when the resident is dying or preventing family members visitation regardless of the status of the individual. And it's really important to determine what sleep patterns are happening and not make assumptions about individual sleep issues. So asking about sleep patterns really needs to be a part of the assessment process and reviewed regularly. And so by identifying sleep patterns right away, it can be possible to prevent falls, behavioral issues and other problems that can result due to lack of sleep. And utilizing non pharmacological approaches, which we talk about with the social prescription, such as reducing noise, light and room temperature, maybe providing aromatherapy, white noises or sound machines, good sleep hygiene or exercise. Those items can really help individuals to improve and it may take baby steps, as we've all seen to really reintroduce, reintroduce excitement, but it needs to be done. And the new focus that we have must shift to resident engagement and getting residents interested in being together once again. So how can we do that? How can we flip the script? Well, first of all, we need to practice person centered care and each of the interactions that we provide to our residents and our families and our staff and our external partners. Because a collaborative effort will help in increasing the desire to do to do more and to do it again. And we know that all of this is going to take time and we recognize that patience is a virtue right so it's really important to realize, most of all, that some elders may prefer their rooms and we've seen that. After all they've been told to isolate for the last two plus years now right so and now we're telling him oh it's safe to come out, but is it and so that's where the where, that's where the concern can come into play. And some residents, they just don't want to come out because they're scared, even if they've been vaccinated, but they don't necessarily understand that it means that it's now safe to be more social. So we need to start slow with that. We need to bring them out a little bit at a time and be encouraging and supportive. So with residents staying in their rooms, it can be helpful to position small portable ovens or in different areas throughout the facility, maybe to bake cookies or make popcorn or help to determine ways that are gonna stimulate the appetite to be more exciting and more, more with that. Wow, that's a great idea. Who doesn't love the smell of fresh baked cookies wafting down the hall, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but it's, it, it's has, you're right, it's been challenging to coax people out of their rooms. Um, but we have to remember no man is an island. You know, it takes a village to care for our elders. And um, social prescribing is everyone's responsibility. It, currently, the resources that could provide needed benefits in, in the community, they're siloed. They're separate agencies that instead should be affiliated with each other. They, they should be working together. And, uh, when I was looking for help for my mom, I had to do the research all on my own. I, 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 I reached out to the Office of the Aging, to different home care agencies, uh, to my local uh, Alzheimer's Association chapter. I, I, I found there was even a respite grant for caregivers. And, but because I had been in long-term care for so long, I was used to hearing references made about these agencies. Um, but if I was someone who had absolutely no knowledge of these types of services, it would have been especially helpful to have gotten some sort of referral from the primary doctor to a link worker who would have acted as a guide. Uh, within a long-term care community, though, the elders should have much more support provided by the different in-house disciplines, the clinicians, you know, the, the physicians, nurse practitioners, psychology, psychiatry, social work, nursing, rehab, along with activities or life enrichment. And they must all work together as an interdisciplinary team to treat the elder holistically with an individualized plan of care that also involves the elder. And uh, to look at the care plan, not just from a clinical point of view, but also from a social point of view. Uh, and these services, they can complement each other and create much more positive outcomes. Also, 
uh, activities and life enrichment staff, since, since they don't typically wear uniforms, are many times perceived as non-threatening and more approachable, right? The elder may be more receptive to their encouragement and reassurance. They may be um, drawn out of their self-isolation, more apt to actively engage in structured programming. And though social prescribing may be a fairly new concept, activity and life enrichment professionals, they knew all along that meeting the needs of the elder, facilitating that social interaction, promoting physical activity, activities that provide cognitive stimulation directly affects the elder's quality of life in a very positive way. It increases their mental health, it improves their mood, it reduces their anxiety, it may even improve memory and cause them to be more hopeful with a more positive outlook on life. And uh, it leads to fewer visits to the hospital, it results in lighter workloads for care providers and empowers them to make choices and have a say in what it is that they want. And activity and life enrichment professionals, we, we help make those important connections. We provide hope, something to look forward to. And you know, the pandemic, it did a lot of damage, but really the problems that came to light, depression, loneliness, cognitive issues, they were always there. It's just, uh, put us in a place that forced us to address as an activity and life enrichment professionals uh, to create some out of, um, out of the box thinking and be creative with how we deliver that person-centered care to, to reach the individual needs of the elder from a social perspective. You know, COVID exposed the weaknesses inherent in the American healthcare system. And surprisingly, According to the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, medical care accounts for only 10 to 20% of a person's well being. The rest, the 80 to 90% of a person's well being, is influenced by the components that make up the social determinants of health. And this is defined by the World Health Organization as the conditions in which people are born and grow and live and work and age. Absolutely, Linda. So I think one of the things that we need to work together on is to bring back the fun. And doing that is really including the residents, the elders in that planning process. Because when individuals feel like they're involved in process, then they want to be involved in whatever the plan is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really an important aspect that we tend to lose sight on as activity professionals and life enrichment directors. We tend to feel like the calendar, you know, we have to put this calendar together and create all these amazing opportunities. But really, it's the residents that are there, the elders that are there to really put that calendar together for us and including them in that planning process is going to help bring the joy back and bring the fun back into it all. So shifting from traditional activities that improve quality of life to exploring the value of engagement and to mentoring creativity is going to be what we must do. And bringing person to person directed care to everything we do will offer a new vision of what elders do with their time in a care community and how to let them express their talents, their interests and their needs. So doing something because it's joyful will give joy. Isn't that just that I think that's interesting to think about doing something joyful will give joy and focusing on activities that are going to be more beneficial beneficial to their mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being will allow for that broader goal to focus on what activities will help improve the lives and the quality of life through focusing on all the dimensions of, per of the individual's health. Carrie, do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. You, you both, Linda, are, you guys are wonderful. 
<laughs> um, and thank you, Linda, as well for your um, for your segment earlier. You've both pointed out so many impactful things related to social prescription um, and the detrimental effect of loneliness and isolation. Linda, your story about your mother is so moving and familiar for so many of us with aging, isolated family members and friends showing decline. Thank you so much for sharing something so personal. Um, and it's wonderful to hear that that more social connection has helped. If we reflect um, on the presentation to, at this point, we can clearly see that we need to fight loneliness in personalized holistic ways. We need to be flexible. We need options and new ideas for those individualized care plans. I would like to encourage all of you, our cherished activity and life enrichment professionals, whether you have joined us for this event today or you're watching at a later time, to feel empowered by this approach. You are the unsung heroes who know how important it is to give the people you care for the personal attention that they need to focus on what matters. Taking a holistic approach to support health and well being, as Linda highlighted earlier, takes quality of life to an entirely different level. Normally, I wouldn't choose to market around activity connection as directly as I'm about to. Yes, I am a marketer, but it's never been our style. And in fact, until this point, we have purposefully chosen not to take that approach during events like this. We've always felt that if we did our best work, if the product was awesome and provided enough value, if we stayed true to our mission, our customers would tell the story for us and they have. We're proudly serving more than 18,500 senior living communities today. But in this case, the needs we have identified here are literally at the center of why Nancy Ewald, an activity director and former national director who oversaw training and programming development for over 170 communities with all settings and levels of care and with the help of her family, founded the company back in 1999. Activity Connection exists to empower and serve activity and life enrichment professionals in supportive ways as a key resource, a community resource that saves you time planning, freeing you up to spend more time prioritizing engagement, creating more time, more joy in the lives of our aging loved ones each day. We give you the tools to individualize engagement to meet the needs of the people you serve, no matter their circumstance. Now I'll touch on technology resources more in a few, but it's important for me to highlight Activity Connection isn't a technology program that helps you track those personalized care plans and attendance, engagement levels, feedback, and all of that good stuff. That is a key resource known as a resident engagement platform. <clears throat> And if you need help with an, a resident engagement platform for your senior living community, our gracious host, Link Senior, has a wonderful platform that offers that functionality and much more. So if you need that, definitely check them out. Instead, Activity Connection is a website that focuses on activities, enrichment, and vitality, providing ready to go activity programming. We give you, the senior care professional, complete ideas to use straight off the site or to riff on to make your own, helping you achieve the goals created within the personalized care plans you manage, delivering on all dimensions of wellness. I won't go too far into the weeds of all of our activity categories on the site, but we do offer more than 40. Many of you are many of you are probably already familiar with them, but I will not mention, but I will mention the slide that Linda presented earlier, highlighting an example of social prescription components featuring the healthy foods and the good sleeping habits, managing stress and exercise, 
finding hobbies, fostering social connections. Each of these categories of social prescription can be creatively supported on an individual or group basis with the resources we provide. And we offer fresh content for every category each month so it never gets stale. That's a big key in your engagement and social prescription goals. You, you've got to keep it fresh, right? Even your time-tested favorite programs to keep them coming back, ensuring that those you care for are looking forward to the next event, the next activity, or even just the next day. And it has to connect with them on an individual basis. We know from experience that that's not easy. Thankfully, we at Activity Connection, we hire activity professionals with deep experience working in senior living as our content creators. So we're very focused in helping you achieve these goals. And we're, we always have an eye on compliance too to help you cover your backs. I hope I've impressed, impressed on you the tremendous value that Activity Connection may be able to help provide in this equation. And if you're not already a member of our community, we hope to have the opportunity to serve your community soon. But I also want to mention a few technological innovations that facilitate optimal living we've collected throughout the years, especially most recently, hoping they might be of value. First, we've noticed mobile devices have become much more prevalent throughout senior living communities. We're seeing a lot of tablets being used by activity professionals to facilitate group and individual activities. We're also seeing more of those in elder care being equipped with tablets of different types to help them play games or enjoy entertainment on their own or even with light support, connecting with care staff, others in their community, <clears throat> and especially families and loved ones outside of the community. Connecting those in your community with their family and loved ones by using technology in different ways can have a very positive effect on many areas of wellness. We also have noticed that there are quite a few content service providers out there that offer wonderful content that might be able to make your program, take your programming to the next level. Exercise, many different types of exercise can be facilitated through content subscriptions and your spiritual or musical program may benefit from a separate subscription as well. There are a lot of options out there. And although technology is great, we have to remember there will always be a place for the traditional printed activity to help communities that may have technological limitations and to support those that wish to have activities outdoors or even away from the building. Uh, ensuring that you have ready access to plenty of printed materials is another important step in covering all bases with your fresh take on activity planning to support the needs we've identified today. Thank you, Carrie. That is just beautifully said about how important technology is and using the different platforms that are available out there, just like Activity Connection and Link Senior. I think the fresh take that you talked about, I really appreciated what you said, Carrie, about the fact that we can't, you know, we can't always rely on our good old activities that we've been doing day in and day out for so many years, you know, times are changing. And the fresh take that we see, as Linda talked about with social prescription and utilizing that link link worker that Linda discussed is also looking at us as the activity professionals right link workers act as community navigators. They spend time and energy getting to know the patient's interests motivations and resources isn't that what we do as activity professionals That's right. Resident, it's just amazing isn't it, thank you Linda mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Residents want to connect with their family members and their friends and even other residents, so what can we do to improve on that. That's, you know, implementing classes for learning. Let's look at computers and languages, arts and music. I just saw a, a social media post the other day where the activity director is now doing weekly how to use your cell phone classes and how exciting that is to really engage in the in with the residents and, and getting them involved in how to really use technology and embrace it because 
I, I, I am a firm believer of print. I know we had this conversation not too long ago is that do you do your calendar in print or do you type it out? And we actually had more people saying that they still hand write their, their, their planning calendar in, in handwritten format and using a daily planner. But, you know, multi-sensory rooms also come into play where residents and individuals can tap into all five of their senses, where we have classical music being played, maybe low lighting, soft materials to feel, aromatherapy with lavender or lava lamps or drumming music, citrus aroma. This, this is a great resource that's available to really help change the meat and meet the needs of the residents. Uh, essential oils or aromatherapy provide for a better quality of life and there's so many amazing benefits that we have learned about how to use aromatherapy to improve sleep and looking at the different resources that are available there. Um, lavender is probably one of the most effective uh, resources that you can use with aromatherapy to help with calming and increasing sleep. Peppermint has been known to, to help with decreasing pain and increasing attention. Uh, cedar wood helps with general uh, overall wellness and upliftment. Uh, citrus, anything like lemon or orange can help with increasing appetite or alertness. Uh, bergamot helps to really increase with mood and depression and helps to decrease uh, stress, which is especially a problem with our short term residents. You know, they're really stressed at being in our community and really engaging in what is going on. So using these fresh ideas, these new resources that have been around, but reintroducing them into our aspect will really, really engage more. Yeah, I love lavender. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are some awesome interventions and approaches, Alyssa. I, I wanted to share uh, this quote. A physician once said, the best medicine for humans is love. And someone asked, what if it doesn't work? And he smiled and said, increase the dose. I love that. CMS requires a non-pharmacological approach before clinical treatment. And, and here we're looking to connect medical care with social care. And if the physician can, can look at their patients from that perspective, then that's half the battle because the staff and families will actually take the suggestions or social prescription from a doctor more seriously. And, and this buy-in would definitely validate what we do as activity and life enrichment professionals, looking at the elder holistically and improving patient outcomes. And also there's, there's this other uh, component of the social prescription that includes nature. And in New Zealand, it's referred to as the green prescription. And this is a type of social prescription made to stimulate a more active lifestyle. A key part of this green uh, prescription is to help the person get more active. And this may be through a structured uh, course or program at your local gym, swimming pool, or community center maybe just getting uh, support to get going with a more active lifestyle, such as uh, uh, walking on your own or in a group, uh, gardening at your home or being part of a community or garden project. And uh, here where I am in the beautiful Hudson Valley in New York, we're fortunate to have a nonprofit organization called Evergreen Minds at evergreenminds.org, led by Dr. Michelle Olson. She's a social gerontologist and founder and executive director, and they do community garden projects and engage in expressive arts and intergenerational programs. And they do something called forest bathing, where they take elders who have dementia out on walks to commune with nature. And Evergreen Minds, they're on a mission to help create a culture that connects people with natural spaces and, and demedicalize and destigmatize the accepted status quo in healthcare for people living with dementia. And this is a fantastic program. But in order to facilitate these types of creative programming ideas, we need to look at how the environment of long-term care can become more receptive so that more of these types of programs are able to happen. And uh, I know, Alyssa, you have lots of information regarding nursing home reform. Yes, thank you, Linda. Yes, let's, let's take a look at this nursing home reform. And the American Healthcare Association 
released last summer a guidance on how and what needs to take place to prioritize the needs of the people we serve. And we know that the nursing home industry has really been at the epicenter of the global health crisis. And um, Amer American Healthcare Association President and CEO Mark Parkinson talked about this, is the chronic issues that we find between underfunding and workforce challenges. And with, you know, really without swift reform, we're going to continue to have the crisis that we face today. And our, vulner our seniors are gonna remain vulnerable. And that's something that we don't really want to, to look forward to, correct, right? We really want to look at ways that we can help with this nursing home reform. And I think number one is really creating effective invent infection prevention programs. Um, I think, you know, we, we got really kind of complacent with this. And I think we really need to be mindful of how important it is to have good quality infection prevention, washing our hands. We know that that's the number one tool that we have available to all of us to help you know, stop the spread of infection. And so looking at that too, is to really update good guidelines in your communities and look at successful strategies to sustain this, to continue moving forward in understanding why infection prevention is so vital. Having 24-hour um, nursing staff, we know that research has shown positive association between RNs and the overall quality, and we know the importance of this, and we, we know, too, that there's, that there's issues with that as well. And looking at, you know, current regulations for nursing homes that do not require that PPE supply, so let's look at how we can do that. Because for too long, nursing homes have really faced chronic Medicaid underfunding and underfunded government mandates. And we know that this left many, many of us unable to afford the enhancements of care delivery, like social prescription, because it does not have that reimbursement rate. We really want to be sure that we allow for social prescription to come into play. And that shift that comes is, you know, looking at that shift to private rooms, right? The average number of nursing homes in our, are around 40 to 50 years old. Right, the traditional care model is no longer considered appropriate for person centered care. And so we have to take that risk. We have to take that leap to look on how we can face and make changes that we need to do in order to meet the needs of our residents. And we do that through really redefining the meaning of our community, repositioning who we are, expanding on the built to the unbuilt environment that we have, including more sidewalks and gardens and paths and opportunities for recreation to allow for those indoor spaces to be redesigned using you know that tiny house feature that we've talked about maybe virtual healthcare spaces to allow for more technology and privacy and patios and balconies that are going to provide for the accessible areas for both active and passive pursuits that is the key integrating technology and in everything we do as an activity professional we are responsible for directing the development, the implementation, the supervision and ongoing evaluation of the activity program. And at NAP, we provide those educational experiences to enhance the activity professionals developmental needs. The National Activity Association of Activity Professionals are firm supporters of the power of education. We are also firm supporters of becoming nationally certified through the National Certification Council for Activity Professionals in meeting the federal requirements. And we hope each of you will take time to continue your education wherever it be through the webinars that NAP provides, that Link Senior provides, becoming nationally certified or even earning college education because knowledge is power. And that is the key there is to seek the knowledge so that we can make a difference in the individuals and the lives that we serve. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I think there was one question, um, and we have about one minute. So um, Jennifer Raymond had a question about workforce reduction and the cost associated to that, Addison. And I was wondering, and maybe if one sentence, if you had in one sentence, any quick thoughts about it. Ah, uh, I don't know if I could do that in one sentence, Charles. But workforce reduction—that's a challenge. Yes, and we are seeing 
the ability to do that because we don't have the staffing. So I think we have to really look at ways to become more creative and utilizing that social prescription to be able to really give the residents the autonomy that they need to be able to express themselves. Thank you, Arisa. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, this amazing presentation. And uh, again, thanks for your patience with the technical difficulty at the beginning. Carrie, I want to start by thanking you for doing an amazing work at moderating this panel and obviously the shout outs, the different shout outs. Linda, um, for me, was most, imp well, most important. I do want to thank you for taking the time to sharing your personal experiences and you know, highlighting something that we've all acknowledged, which is that this pandemic exposed for the most part things that already, already were there. And I think it was great to have this balance with Alice and your thoughts there, which is, I like to summarize them by you know, what you said about bringing back the fun, which things need to be fun, right? We need to have that energy back. And um, thank you all for joining. Alice, thanks again for joining the third time in a row and a uh, great panel. I'll let you stick around, please stick around, but turn off your camera. And I'd love to invite to the stage,